Um, my name's Gavin Smith. I'm the editor of Film Comment. Uh, to my uh, to my right is Film Comment's new deputy editor, Ken Jones, who is also the director of the New York Film Festival. And to my left is Robert Kohler, uh, who is the new director of programming at the Film Society. Um, and the three of us are going to um, discuss uh, Film Comment's best films of uh, 2012 poll, which uh, um, was finalized uh, a few days ago. Uh, all three of us participated in the voting, uh, along with approximately 100 to 120 um, um, national uh, uh, national critics from, well, around the country. Um, I think one thing that uh, I want to start out with a general observation about is, is that I guess in the end a poll like this is, is, is a form of, uh, as a way of forming a consensus. Uh, the magazine publishes a special section on the, uh, the year in review uh, and we publish uh, 10 best lists from film critics, uh, both uh, from the US and also from around the world. Um, the people who uh, are based overseas don't vote in the poll. Um, but nevertheless, what's striking to me is that this year in the list that we've been publishing from countries as diverse as Japan and Poland and France and Russia, uh, is that the same films are coming up again and again as the top films of the year, um, very much there's a certain uniformity um, all across the world um, that, that's reflected in this poll. And, and that for me is, on the one hand, uh, kind of uh, um, very striking and, and, and remarkable. On the other hand, a little disheartening because uh, I, I like the idea of, of uh, hearing what other people in other parts of the world think. And I've always had this assumption that, that you would get very different points of view and very different perspectives on um, what the, the state of cinema is right now and what, what are the, the important films of the last year. And in fact, the, uh, across the globe, there seems to be a consensus about the top 10 to 20 films. Um, so that's the general observation I wanted to make. And um, maybe uh, either of you want to kind of uh, respond to that. Consensus from everyone except Olaf Muller. And me. Right. <laughs> yeah, and they're the ones who matter. Um, <laughs> right. Well, no, I, I mean, it may, it may reflect, uh, that sort of pattern may reflect the fact that some of the most important films of the year play at these festival events where so much of the concentration, critical mass of critics uh, actually attend. Um, because when you look at the films on that reach the top 10, uh, you know, a striking number of them come out of Cannes. Yes, that's true. Uh, really, apart from uh, Lincoln and Zero Dark Thirty. Um, and the Turin Horse. Yeah, almost um, mo most of these, and, and the Master. But I if they weren't in Cannes, they were in Venice or in Berlin. Right. So right. Uh, there isn't a single film here that hasn't had significant... Well, Lincoln it would be the only one. Lincoln, I don't think, is, uh, was presented at any film festival. And Zero Dark Thirty. Right. No. But then there's also the simpler answer, which is just sometimes, you know, when a film is as great as The Master, it's not surprising that it turns up on people's lists all over the world. Um, that's one, you know, thought to just throw into the stew. And one could say simil something similar about many of the films on this list. Um, I don't. Th I think that Moonrise Kingdom, no matter where it played, you know, or Holy Motors, probably would have hit people in the same way. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, I think that what may also be the case is that many of the films ranking here certainly, I would um, go even, even uh, as far down, certainly as far down as to twenty, and in literally even number twenty, Neighboring Sounds by mm -hmm. Clever Mendoza Fio. It's it. Uh, what we're looking at is a, a weighted amount of really strong films. I mean, these are, in some cases, even great films, uh, films that we'll be talking about 10, 20, 30 years from now, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and in some cases, films that uh, redefine the, filmmaker, the individual filmmakers' careers. Uh, it's certainly... In the case of Leos Carax, Holy Motors, I think, has uh, in almost, in a, some ways, relaunched his career. I mean, it, it's kind of like re, 
repositioned him back to the kind of position he was in uh, when he first exploded out uh, uh, onto the scene. Well, yeah. really, I mean, Holy Motors is kind of his breakout film. Uh, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I prefer all of his previous, uh, his earlier films, uh, but I don't think he ever really had that breakthrough to kind of general acceptance that, that Holy Motors has given him. I think, I, I mean, I really think it's, uh, I mean, I, th I think I made a comment that this was the year where the late Leos Carax came in from the cold. Um, uh, I don't think uh, if we'd been doing this poll uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago that, that um, uh, Les Amants du Pont Neuf or, or, or Bad Blood or, or I don't think those films would have placed as highly as, as Holy Moses has. Yeah, but there's another factor which is that there's, an, there's the factor, let's say the absence makes the heart grow fonder factor um, because it's been years since Leos made a movie. And then also the f what Holy Motors is in relation to cinema and in relation to being a middle-aged man, um, set it apart, not just from his other films, but I think from other films, period. I mean, it kind of stands, it's pretty much sui generis. Um, and that's something that I think is very, one of the, th those are factors that make it very, very special to people. Yeah, I mean, uh, really, apart from perhaps um, this is not a film, it's a film that, that s speaks directly to the concerns of the kinds of people who actually do vote in these kinds of polls and who uh, really have a strong commitment and, and investment in, in cinema and its future and its past. Mm -hmm. um, I mean well, it's a film that speaks to exhaustion. It speaks, as he said, it speaks to the exhaustion of you know, getting tired of being the same person every day. But then it also speaks to the exhaustion of just so many stories being told, so many films, so many plots, so many situations, so many characters, you know. Um, uh, I think that that's something that makes it, that gives it that, that resonance. I, it's striking, too, that when you think about a film such as Holy Motors and then, uh, and then a film like This Is Not a Film, just in terms of scale of of access to technology and access to um, the kinds of things that can create a spectacle on the screen. I mean, I was interested. I I was looking at this and I was thinking about the element of spectacle that either is or is not in in some of these films, or is even denied. Um, or, ab or deliberately absent from some of these films, and that in some cases that's a matter of circumstance, and then sometimes it's a matter by design. Um, uh, and the most interesting example of that in some ways in its perversity of looking both poor but actually being quite elaborately produced in its own way is the Turin horse, mm. um, which looks like to borrow a term from Yertsi Grotowski in theater, appears to be poor cinema, but, but is, is in fact not, <laughs> and is in fact a case of a production that took two years to make in which the sets were entirely built yeah. from the ground up in which helicopters were used. I mean, uh, you know, it, these ways in which in different countries and in different um, uh, uh, production situations that scale of, of ske uh, a spectacle is, is used is, is really fascinating and it's addressed in many different ways among these films. Yeah, I would sort of add to that that, that um, aside from the, the question of scale, one of the things that really jumps out at me when I look at this list of films is that probably with the exception of one or two of them um, lower down, every single film is marked by a, having a very distinctive stylistic signature. Um, I mean, these are very much films that are completely reflective of uh, a strong, uh, decisive style that is the, the signature style of each filmmaker. Um, I, really I really don't see too many that, that actually deviate from that. And that's, I mean, that's, again, uh, I think a, a way of confirming um, the a certain kind of um, uh, way of a, a certain kind of audience, a certain kind of cinephile audience, is able to kind of really um, connect 
with style and with distinctive stylistic voices, distinctive visions. Um, I don't know if going back over previous uh, polls, the same thing could be said, but here I'm, I'm really struck by that. Yeah, although the it strikes me that the film at the top of the list might be an exception to that rule because um, it's it's a movie that's that's um, I mean it's a break with his his previous way of working, but nevertheless there is a really strong there's there's it it has a very strong and distinctive voice that isn't really like anything else. No, that's true. But what I mean is that in his earlier work. He, in his first three films, he was working with a cinematographer who unfortunately passed away, but with whom he developed such a tight working relationship that that really constituted a style that wasn't present in Polo X, mm -hmm. which is his last film, or in the um, the short that he made, or in the obviously in the compilation short that he made for Khan. Um, also, I think the master, I, I, you know, if, if stylistic consistency is a whole other topic. But you know, if you're talking about a film like The Master, as opposed to something like Amour, where you look at it and despite a lot of comments that I've heard about the movie, it seems completely of a piece with ev everything I've ever seen by Michael Haneke in every way. Um, but The Master is, that's a guy whose aesthetic and style is always evolving. And well, it's it's this right. does seem like the logical next step after um, There Will Be Blood. I mean, it seems like that you can trace a, a clear trajectory in this style. So I'm not n not arguing that, that, you know, these are, uh, you know... Uh, well, I, I guess you could say in the, in, in the case of, of Hanukkah and the Dardan brothers, mm, uh, maybe uh, Jaylan, mm -hmm. the, they're making films the way they, they, they've established a certain style and that's mm -hmm. what they're continuing to, 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 to hone. Um, others also strong stylistic voices and maybe still on a kind of an evolving trajectory. Mm -hmm. I, I think with with Chalon, Chalon is a fascinating case though. I think that is a particularly remarkable film mm. um, that has perhaps gotten a little bit lost in the discussion and I suspect that 10, 20 years from now we're going to look back and realize that that was uh, an especially remar remarkable achievement because I think that it actually represents um, something a little different from most of the films. Many of the films here, I think, do challenge narrative um, in uh, conventional uh, film narratives as, as we consider them. Um, they, they, they either obliterate them entirely or really challenge them, confront them, uh, break them down, shatter them in some ways. Um, not all of them, uh, not all of these films, of course, but many of them do. Uh, and Once Upon a Time in Anatolia is actually, in that regard, a little bit more traditional mm -hmm. in its way, mm -hmm. but it absorbs all the past work that Chalon has done, and then I think he's found a way to really make a grand artistic leap beyond uh, his past work and consolidate um, the achievements he's done, and I think that consolidation and then leaping beyond what you have done before is, that's actually a characteristic that runs through several of these films, mm -hmm. and I think that's true of Wes Anderson, too, in this. I mean, I think he, with Moonrise, he, he also has consolidated a lot of the ideas he was kicking around. I mean, I don't think he could have made this film before Fantastic Mr. Fox, mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, One and thing, you know okay, that that I, I I think that's that's another way of looking at at, at some of these films. Well, I also it brings to mind the, you know the case of Lincoln, which is very interesting because um, I, I think a lot of people found it surprising. A lot of people found it to be like a history lesson. We heard that one a lot, um, or a play. Maybe because it's written by a playwright. Um, maybe because there's a lot of dialogue in it. I don't know. It certainly doesn't move like a play. Um, but it is a film in which, which I think, even if you didn't like it, and I liked it very much, it would um, be a little surprising coming from Steven Spielberg. Um, and then Lincoln brings to mind uh, a film that is not on this list, which is kind of interesting, which is the Tarantino film. Uh, indeed, and actually, I think that what we're looking at, 
I, I can't possibly um, not talk about Django Unchained. In, well, Django Unchained is, is number 21. Yeah, so number it just, 21. It just, it's just, oh. just didn't quite just make didn't it. didn't quite enchant. Neighboring um, sounds pipped it. In some, in some ways, I, you know, I know that uh, in some cases there were critics groups that actually were critics actually did not see the film even mm -hmm. before they voted. Um, but, but I think with Django, with Zero Dark Thirty, with Lincoln, um, we are there, I think, seeing finally the emergence of the Obama era movie, mm -hmm. which has been a while in coming, and that's, that's pretty normal. I mean, I think the normal phase of things and time takes to gestate and, and politics to gestate and movies to be made, um, that it's not surprising that, that finally in the fourth year that the Obama era movie is finally emerged. I think it, uh, that uh, the one way to read Lincoln mm -hmm. is that it's Tony Kushner's letter to Barack Obama. I well, mean, that there is... Hopefully there's more than one way to read Lincoln. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's yeah. one way of, of, of looking at it because actually Kushner has talked about how much he admired mm -hmm. uh, the tradition of British playwrights who mm -hmm. uh, write plays for the stage that are in fact directly addressed to the government in power at the moment. Yes. And that he, one of his ambitions as a playwright is literally to do that. And I think he actually managed to do that with Lincoln. Yeah. He did that with one of, I think there was an Afghanistan play that yeah. he yeah. did as well. Yeah, yeah th um, this would be as opposed to, by the way, Silver Linings Playbook, which would be an Eisenhower era movie. <laughs> <I think. laughs> Indeed. Or maybe Nixon era. Also, I cannot um, not mention what for me was my personal favorite film of the year. Um, taboo. taboo. Yeah. Um, Miguel Gomez's um, absolutely magical piece of, you know, kind of story storytelling uh, trans uh, d uh, you know, transferred across eras and continents. Um, that seems like an impossible film to have been made, and yet he makes it almost seemingly effortlessly. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have to wrap it up now. So. Uh, um, okay. Thank you both. I got that taboo. We'll see you next year, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> film fans. <laughs> All right.